Hello and welcome once again to Greatest Somerville, Greatest Somerville's coverage of the 2018 Massachusetts election. My name is Joe Lynch and my guest is State Representative from the 27th Middlesex District, Denise Provo. Denise is a former attorney, City of Somerville employee, alderman at large here in the city of Somerville, and for the past 13 years she has represented 11 of the 21 precincts here in the city of Somerville on Beacon Hill. It is my pleasure to welcome her back to the Somerville Media Center. She is running for re-election this November. Welcome back. Thank you, Joe. I've lost count of how many times you've been down here at the Media Center. I haven't been keeping count. Well, between supporting the Media Center, you do every year at our annual meeting, you are here, between coming in for uh, special editions of Greatest Somerville, coming in for election, uh, running for election, I've lost count of how many times you've been down here too, but welcome back. It's good to be back. November 6th? Is election day. Election day. We're gonna be doing some PSAs down here at Somerville Media Center about voting, and hopefully, um, we've already filmed and taped with Senator Jalen, uh, State Representative Barber, one of your colleagues in the State House, and next week, Representative Mike Conley comes in. Mm -hmm. The entire delegation loving it down here at, State, at Somerville Media Center. Well, that's great because it's not a moment too soon. Early voting in Somerville starts on October 22nd. The 22nd, put it on your calendars. I love early voting. I don't know about the rest of the voters out there, but I love it. It works for a lot of people. Yep. I voted early last year. Last year. And yep. there were crowds. At City Hall. Yes, there were lines. I was there. We yeah. covered it at, for a Somerville Media Center, Somerville Neighborhood News. It was amazing to me how many people just said, this is so much easier than waiting in the cold in the morning. That's true. Yeah, it's and terrific. People in Somerville love to vote. October 22nd, don't forget. And then if you can't, you can always vote by, via absentee ballot. If not, vote on November 6th. Right, but if you're voting absentee, remember that you have to get your application in so you can get your ballot back so that you can have enough time for the mail delivery to get it back by November 6th. Otherwise, it won't count. There you go, and every vote counts. Denise Provo. What's happening on the state in the state house level since the last time you were here? What's happening in your campaign and what's happening in the next session? Congratulations, by the way. Let me be the first to congratulate you on being elected on November 6th since you are unopposed. Oh, well, thank you for your <laughs> good wishes. That's the uh, appropriate response. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I thought you were going to congratulate me for being elected in my primary election. Uh, back in September. In September. Yes. Right. There's uh, one reporter who described himself to me as an elections nerd, walked up to me in the state house and said, congratulations. And I said, for what? He said, you got more votes than any unopposed candidate in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's nothing to sneeze at. I'm not sneezing. I, yeah. I'm grateful. And I thank all the voters who gave me that vote back well, in September. You know, more and more... Um, there used to be this flavor, Denise, of, of people saying, well, my vote doesn't matter, so I'm just not going to vote. I'm seeing something, and I don't know, you probably see it too. I'm seeing something amongst the younger voters that are saying, we're not going to subscribe to that anymore. We're going to vote, and we're going to vote in throngs of people coming out on Election Day. Are you sensing that same thing, that more and more young voters are re-engaging? Oh, I am. There, there were a lot of young people, including some I'd never met before at my Thanksgiving table last year. Mm -hmm. And they had all voted, and they were indignant at the idea that, that they might not have voted or might not have been interested in voting. Mm -hmm. they, they took the idea of the ballot very seriously. Right, right. And that's new. Yeah, I, I hope it continues. I mean, as you know, down here at the Media Center, we encourage people to vote, 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 vote. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, the talking heads like me, you know, we can have elected officials on all we want and talk about what you want to talk about. It, I might not represent what they, the issues that are important to them. And some of the shows may not represent what's important to them. 
The way that you can express that is A, get engaged with the folks who are running for elective office, and B, do not let anything get in your way to vote. Uh, yes, and once you have elected someone, make sure that you let them know, give them feedback, let them know what you care about, um, what kind of policies you want to see adopted. Um, folks in Somerville have always been vocal. I think they're getting more so. So speaking of, speaking of vocal and mm -hmm. speaking of issues that are relevant in the 2018 Massachusetts uh, election, I did notice that um, on your website, you take a very, very strong stand on question th three. Question, oh, absolutely. Question well, three. So you yes. take it away. Explain what question three is and why you're sure. voting. Question three is to uphold legal equality for all people in Massachusetts, including transgender people. Um, I feel personally invested in it because um, these rights were adopted in two parts. First, in a bill that was sponsored by Carl Shertino, who used to represent Somerville and Medford, and then uh, in the last session, uh, I had the bill to, um, to make the legal equality complete. Mm -hmm. So this victory, having been won, uh, is now on the ballot for repeal, which would be a terrible thing uh, for Massachusetts with its history of championing civil rights and civil liberties to deny legal equality to any portion of its population. And you cited some numbers on one of the polls that was done, and it's a little closer than you would think in Massachusetts. It's, it's in the 40s of people saying, yes, repeal that, that protection. There have been different polls, and, and there have been some better numbers since then, but the fact that, the fact that, uh, that civil rights can even be on the ballot is unsettling, and they wouldn't be except that we have a separate constitutional provision that allows for the repeal of existing laws. This would not have met the standard as a, a start from scratch initiative to reduce rights because that's one of the that's one of the matters which are prohibited from going on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Where is the, what's the impetus? What are the groups that are behind saying repeal this? There's um, there's an outfit called the Massachusetts Family Institute. Um, there's there's a group which is uh, allied with it, which is called Catholic Citizen, which. Um, from my research um, reveals no uh, connections um, sanctioned or informal with the Catholic Church. They're using the moniker to try to attract other folks. I would yeah. guess so, yes. Yeah. So I, I was going to ask the question, and I, I think you've answered the question, that it, it doesn't appear as though there are any religious groups that are actually behind this repeal effort, but there are people who have religious beliefs that may not align with the transgender, um, LBGTQ community. I'm sure there, I know there are people with those beliefs and, um, and everyone's entitled to their religious beliefs, but we don't typically in this country um, allow anyone's religious beliefs to interfere with the civil rights of others, or at least we haven't since the Puritans. Right. One of the things that the Founding Fathers got right was the separation of church and state. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I'm going to take it away. Um, I just I wanted to ask you that mm -hmm. question on the ballot initiative, one of the ballot initiative questions. Take it away in terms of stuff that you have um, been very successful with in the last session stuff that's going to have to get refiled after you get reelected in November. Well, um, I, I, I'll do that. And, and there's a, a third category, too, which is bills I am still working. Um, I happen to have 
Probably about 15 <laughs> sheets of, uh -huh. but um, let, let me just give you, I, I'll give you a quick, it's by Miss Provost of Somerville, a petition, <laughs> by Miss Provost of Somerville, a petition, accompanied by the bill, accompanied by the bill. So yeah, there's probably about 14, 15 pages of bills here, so. Yes, and, and of course the city of Somerville has uh, a statewide distinction of enacting more home rule petitions than any other municipality. We've had more than a dozen this year. Right. And actually, I just managed to get one of those engrossed in the house, um, which is, will be a great one for homeowners in Somerville. It's a um, petition that will allow for a residential exemption for sewer and water rates. Terrific. So, I like that one. Yeah. But, yeah. So it's gone over to the Senate side now. I think it's in Senate third reading at the moment. So I'm looking forward to that being en engrossed in the Senate and come back to the House for enactment, get enacted in the Senate, go to the governor. So what it basically means to the homeowners or homeowners in the city of Somerville is that w you will be eligible for a reduced rate or a reduced um, fee, whatever it is. Yeah, some kind yeah. of some kind of reduction. Reduction uh, in what you pay on water and sewer. Uh, the way the way that there is a residential exemption for property, for property taxes. taxes right. And you know, um, I, it might be a alleviation of that highly unpopular sixty dollar fee that mm -hmm. got slapped on, which mm -hmm. for more people is more than they pay for water that they've used. Right. Um, I don't, it may be too complicated to do it through rate, but um, because it's- Because the rate is actually set by the MWRA. <sighs> the rate, MWRA certainly has rates that they charge the city. I think that since we set up the sewer and water enterprise fund, we add on to that rate for okay. the city's administrative costs and for uh, capital investments in sewer and water infrastructure. But, but it is complex and um, I, I, it seems to me that going after that add-on fee would be the simple and elegant solution. For those of you new to the city, um, the city instituted last year or the year before? I think it was the year before. Year before Possibly. a $60 connection fee. I, and I railed against it on mm -hmm. the show, saying that you know the city of Somerville and its money grab sometimes is looking more and more like the big utilities and the cable companies that every time you turn around, there's another line yeah. item on there saying, you know, um, I don't want to be flip about it, but you, you, you are a comfortable sofa s fee. Yeah, and they just keep adding. So, you know, the $60 connection fee, if it gets rid of it, bravo to you. But Well, uh, you know, one, once it's enacted, assuming that it makes it. And the governor signs it. The governor, it. Yeah. if the governor signs it and it becomes law, the city of Somerville gets to decide how right. it's going to be implemented. Great. But, um, you know, that was, uh, that was just huh, a, week, a week ago Monday. Terrific. Um, and on next Monday, I'm meeting with a minority leader to see if I can get him to agree to, um, to the en enactment or it would be engrossment first in the House of a bill that's already been enacted in the Senate, um, which is very important to Somerville because of, of the amount of sewage that gets put still into the Mystic River mm -hmm. through outflows. It's a bill that would require public notification when there are discharges of sewage into any river or lake in the Commonwealth. And a lot of people are shocked that we don't do that already. A lot of people are shocked to find out that there are discharges of raw sewage into inland waters. And what causes that to happen when you get an overflow situation within the capacity of the system? You're allowed to let it go into other bodies of water? Well, the, it's built into the system. In, right. in a lot of, of older cities and towns, you have what are called combined sewer overflows, right. where if you get a, a lot of rainfall, um, 
because the the sanitary sewers and the storm drains are connected underground, mm -hmm. the rainwater washes the sewage mm -hmm. out of those pipes into um, the overflow. Over, in, yeah, into what are called outfalls. Yeah. Occasionally, um, there's so much that it comes up to the right. surface right. that you get surcharges, and the contaminated water flows over the ground into the nearest water body. Um, another thing that happens that that got a lot of attention last October was mm -hmm. um, Halloween weekend. Mm -hmm. There was a huge storm that knocked down trees and then electricity all over the, the North Shore. And um, there was at least one sewage treatment facility on the Merrimack River. I remember this. Yep. That lost its power and it couldn't pump. Right. And because it couldn't pump, it just discharged millions and millions of gallons of raw sewage into the Merrimack River. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Mystic or the Charles, there are six communities that get their drinking water out of the From Merrimack. The Merrimack right. And the mayors of those communities were beside themselves. And the, the, this facility had no backup pumps. So this, this bill, though, that you filed, and hopefully we'll get through, yeah. this bill doesn't take care of that situation where something overflows into a, a public body of water. What it does, though, it, it mandates that the public has to be notified yes. about what happened. Exactly. Right. And the way that can make a difference for people um, a lot of it is recreationally, you know, um, the, the, the first, one of the, one of the first incidents that, uh, that got me interested in this topic was my first year in office, there were two Somerville High School students who were assigned to shadow me for the day. And one of them saw a map in my office of Somerville, you know, mm -hmm. bordered by the Mystic and said, you know, I row for the Somerville crew team. And sometimes when we're out in the water practicing, I see stuff floating in the water mm. that, is that really what I think it is? And I said, yeah, unfortunately. And he said, well, what are you gonna do about it? And now you are. Uh, oh, yeah. And well, it's the start of it. Yeah. It's the start well, of it. Well, and this, you know, this bill has been, this bill is one that Senator Jalen and I have both filed over many sessions. Uh, I think what happened in the Merrimack gave it a boost in this session. It has bipartisan support, and I'm hoping that it can be on that very, very short list of substantive bills that get the nod before this session ends. Great. There's another, there's another topic of discussion. I just caught wind of it in the past week or so. Another topic of a discussion where the local elected officials on the Board of Aldermen here are going to be coming to you and saying, help us with this, which is the, um, the way that DCR administers the parks that they administer mm -hmm. here in the city of Somerville. So they still have control over Dilboy, they have control yes. over Foss, they have control over um, some pieces of land along the Mystic River here in the city. So, so I guess... The question, the question I would ask, forget the Board of Aldermen is going to ask their own question. Is there ever going to be a day when we can get DCR out of the picture completely and own Dilboy outright and Foss outright and the Mystic River lands outright? Uh, a very good question to which there is no clear answer because it has more of a political than a legal answer. Mm. DCR is a state agency. Um, Foss Park, as you know, used to be a city of Somerville Park, which mm -hmm. it sold to DCR's predecessor, right. MDC, in the early 50s, right. I believe. And right now, uh, with Dilboy, the city has a management agreement right. that it's negotiated with DCR. Uh, and DCR is, as you point out, the, the main principal owner of a lot of land along the banks of the Mystic, not just in Somerville, but, you know, there's the, that big park, McDonald, maybe, that's on the, in Medford on Torbett the other McDonald side. McDonald Park. Yes. Yep. Um, 
by the state police mm -hmm. barracks and lots of land all up and down. Um, and I suppose there, there are pros and cons for state ownership versus local ownership. The, of, the, the of local park ownership lands. is you get to control what you do at the parks, you get to control your own regulations. The downside is you have to maintain it and you have to pay for any improvements exactly. to it. But the problem comes in is that when you have a state agency like DCR who owns so much across the state, the D state itself, they're not properly funded. So you have a case of where you have Foss Park, which is so utilized, but in such bad disrepair, DCR is unwilling to pay for the upkeep. Well, the delegation got upwards of $5 million in this last operating budget earmarked for Foss Park. Mm -hmm. So there will be money going into Foss. And you know, there were substantial improvements put into Dilboy. You know, the, the, um, the stadium and the right. track, those were right. all new about right. the time that I was first elected in 2006 and named after Senator Shannon who was recently deceased. Late Senator Charlie Shannon. Exactly, yeah. uh, in, in honor of him. So, and, and you know, the first year that I was elected, I got a million plus put into the hockey rink down mm -hmm. on Somerville Avenue mm -hmm. because it didn't have a backup compressor. Right. Um, the compressor that it had wasn't in great shape. And there, there were a lot, of, um, a lot of other improvements made at that time. So, you know, so, so park and recreational facilities need a capital budget as well as an operating budget. But you're right, DCR has um, $450 million acres statewide, mm -hmm. um, you know, including Mount Tom. They have mm -hmm. vast amounts mm -hmm. of land and from, from urban parks to wilderness that the agency is, is responsible for. Um, you yeah, know. I guess I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, <coughs> excuse me, DCR should probably think about getting out of the business of owning urban parks. Well, maybe, maybe. But, you know, when you have the municipal, like if you look at um, reservoirs and, and mm -hmm. ponds where people mm -hmm. swim, mm -hmm. um, Arlington, Lexington, Medford, you can only swim there if you're a resident, a resident. of the town. Right, so, Holland in Medford. Right. Yep. So, right. <laughs> and, uh, but if, you know, so when my kids were growing up, if we wanted to swim someplace that mm -hmm. wasn't a pool, mm -hmm. um, I would have to take them up to the Mystic Lakes, Mystic. which is yep. a DCR facility right. and a well maintained. DCR facility, although sometimes there's too much bacteria in the water to swim mm -hmm. because bathing beaches get tested and posted, right. whereas right. rivers and, uh, and, and lakes and ponds that aren't official swimming beaches don't, well, which is where I, my bill comes Well, I didn't in. mean to imply that the delegation isn't doing their job and getting the money. I just think in the city of Somerville, it might be a lot easier if we could control our own destiny with those big parcels of land. And you know, and I'm not opposed to that. I'm not opposed to that. I'm just, you know, we're, we're playing out the pros and the cons right. here, especially a community like Somerville that has so little parkland. In fact, Somerville has the least parkland per capita right. of any municipality right. in the Commonwealth. And that's a hardship um, for everyone. Right, right. Let's move on to some of the other issues that you're gonna be working hard on next session. What's okay. coming up in that um, that docket that you've got about this high yeah, on your, yeah. your desk? Well, um, refiling a lot of the same bills. Mm -hmm. um, I'm next week. I'm doing a presentation um, to a section of the Mass Bar Association. Um, my bill respecting uh, police body cameras. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Boston's made a commitment to do it. EOPS, uh, State Executive Office of Public Safety has made some grants available, but there's no standardization of the rules for body cameras. 
from department to department? Exactly. Right. So they need to be unified. Um, I think I, you know, I don't want. I don't want to go into all kinds of wonky detail. No, but wonky here's a, details, here's a but question for you: Do you agree with the uh, body camera use by police departments? Oh well, you know, Boston did a scientific study of their pilot, and they have concluded that it is beneficial. Um, they they see fewer complaints against the police. They find um, that that there's some less litigation. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think you should know from someone who, who spends so much time in a, a television station, people tend to behave better in front of cameras. They sure do. They sure do. When, yes. the eyes, when the eyes are on you, your behavior is altered. And that, whether that's the camera lens or a couple of eyeballs looking yep. at you. So, you know, I, I have, I have um, a lot of opinions and thoughts about personal privacy when it yes. comes to the use of body cams in the same way that when we use these mm -hmm. every day, you know, there are rules and regs about filming somebody when they haven't given you permission to do so. So I, I, I understand the law enforcement side of it, but I also think it needs to be fleshed out. That's why we need to have rules which are, are uniform, yep. which protect personal privacy and, you know, cover everything from uh, how you treat these recordings under the public records law to how they're handled in discovery if there is litigation because you need to protect minors, victims, mm -hmm. innocent bystanders, right, right. Um, people who might be unclothed or partially unclothed right, at the right. time of, of the filming. And including medical, medical privacy. Exactly. There are issues oh, all, all of it. To be all with. of it, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and so um, I've been... Pushing forward on I, that I've one. been working with, uh, with this section of the Bar Association, and, and I think we're, we're of the same mind. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. You know, I, I always tell you, when I, got, I look at the clock and then I go, where did 28 minutes just go? We're getting towards the end. If people want to learn more about your re-election campaign, where they can donate, how they can get in touch with you, it is deniseprovo.org. It is. All right. Did I have it right? You did. I think I did. Yep. I think I did. So best wishes in November. Thank you. I'm sure we'll be seeing you campaigning not only for yourself, but for some other folks that you'll be doing work yes, for. Yes, as I have been already and Terrific. will continue to do. Okay. There we go. Uh, campaign 2018 here in the city of Somerville and across Massachusetts. My guest has been State Representative Denise Provo. As always, stay safe, stay informed, and don't forget to vote on November 6th. For our Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. See you next time.